Warning, Lucinda's not here today, so I doubt we'll even make it through the fucking warning before we start cussing. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by My Sheets Rock, Stamps.com, and by the new low-cost solution for assholes who won't wear masks in public, tackling those motherfuckers and strapping a wide strip of tape over their faces. Masking tape. The name finally makes sense. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Greetings. I'm from New Zealand, and on behalf of all New Zealanders, I would like to apologize for Ray Comfort. However, due to the nature of geopolitics, I like to think that Americans first inflicted him upon us through exporting their religion. So, no take backsies. He's your problem now. You see, it all began when we did, in fact, evolve from Filthy Monkey Men. It's August 6th. And it's Corporate Baby Name Day. What? Are you serious? Citizens United is really getting out of hand. This is nuts. <laughs> I'm No Illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And from Bernie Getz went to NYU, and so did Eli. This is New Jersey. <laughs> Cincinnati Swing State. And Good Husband Georgia. This is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, we'll discover the worst thing about Pastor Greg Locke. Roy Moore thinks about suing the... General discovery process of all lawsuits for <laughs> defaming him. And Seth Andrews will be here to tell us what he was thinking before he was thinking. But first, the diatribe. Let me be clear, at least on this one thing. If your argument is that 2 plus 2 equals salt, the fact that you've read up on it extensively just makes you dumber. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm deferential to expertise, but to be an expert in something, the thing has to exist. You can't be an expert in sexing chupacabras no matter how much you read up on the subject. I don't need to examine astrological charts to know stars don't influence our personalities. I don't need to read books about homeopathy to know that water doesn't have memory. And I don't need to work my way through Girdle's ontological proof to reject the notions of God. I'm reminded of this constantly because there are a couple of jackass apologists who follow me on social media and chime in constantly to scoff at my oversimplification of theistic arguments. Have I even read such and such obscure theologians specifically chosen for their obscurity? Am I even familiar with St. Earthen Howard's 22 statements or whatever? Do I even theology, bro? And of course I haven't. Of course I'm not. And of fucking course I don't because I'm not a fucking idiot. 2 plus 2 doesn't equal salt. I already knew that without reading any books on the subject. Now, I'm not saying an intelligent person can't learn about this shit, right? Like, I got a lot of colleagues that want to get down in the muck and wrestle with these dumbasses. And if that's your thing, I'm sure it helps to read up on all the abstruse dumbassery that they're going to throw at you. Some people are just fascinated by the variety in religious beliefs or enjoy the mental exercise of picking apart bad arguments. Some people are just trying to get their heads around what they used to believe. But for it to be an intellectual pursuit at all, you have to start off by rejecting the premise. Like You can learn a lot by reading Shakespeare's plays, but only if you admit that they're works of fiction going in. But that doesn't seem to occur to the apologists on my fucking Facebook page. They chime in with their well-sourced arguments and their obscure citations and seem to think they've just demonstrated some kind of intelligence. But this is definitely one of those rare cases where demonstrating knowledge betrays stupidity. I, I mean, if the person arguing on behalf of Jesus comes at me with some, but what if you're wrong or why are there still monkeys level bullshit? I realize they've just never seen the counter arguments. Right. They, they believe what they were told. They never really questioned it. And they clung to the first half ass argument the preacher man gave them. And I can respect that to a certain degree. Right. Like I, as much as I love to learn new shit, I know I can't learn everything. There are certain subjects I don't bother to look into. That's true for everybody. You know, if you show up with arguments that are that bad, you haven't shown yourself to be stupid, just uninformed. But if you show up with the latest and greatest in Christian apologetics, that's because you're stupid. 
I mean, think about it. We're talking about people who got all the way through an apologetics book without realizing that they were wrong. Multiple books in many cases. That's pretty fucking stupid. They they went all the way through without ever thinking to themselves, ah, wow, a couple thousand years we've been trying to pin this shit down and this is the best we've managed, huh? What's worse, they went back for seconds. They kept going back until they'd exhausted all the mainstream shit and went looking for the obscure stuff. That, my friends, is your stupidity doubling down on itself. And that's what makes it so hilarious when they brandish this like some kind of badge of brilliance. I see them toss off the arguments of atheists for being unsophisticated as though their nonsense required sophistication to refute. Of course, I have to clarify that I'm not saying all religious people are stupid or that all non-religious people are smart. The whole smart versus stupid dichotomy doesn't work all that well when it comes to entire human beings. Right? You have to be on an extreme for either of those labels to apply to you across the board. So I'm not talking about stupidity or intelligence of a person as a whole. I'm talking about the narrow stupidity as it applies to religion. A person can be brilliant in any number of different fields and still be a fucking idiot when it comes to religion. But honestly, if you have the mental capacity to be brilliant in terms of math or science or philosophy or something, and you still can't puzzle out the God thing, That actually makes you dumber on that subject than a person who's just too dumb to puzzle it out. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the Triforce of Power and Triforce of Courage to my Triforce of Wisdom, Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick. Fellas, are you ready to be held aloft by an elf? Noah, I shared my Breath of the Wild erotic fan fiction with you privately. You know I am ready to be held in love by a It's called Breasts of the Wild. Okay. Yeah, that's that's all. Uh, <laughs> I also wrote one, Majora's Mask Mandate. Ooh. Nice. All right. Well, we've got some private artwork to commission Angelo for. So while we do it's that, porn. we're going to pause for a word from this week's <laughs> first sponsor, My Sheets Rock. Lou, Lou, Lou. Just getting a midnight snack. Midnight snack is my favorite snack. Dude, Lulu. close the door. The ah, light no. comes what are you, on. What are you doing sleeping in my fridge? I, I'm a hot sleeper. This is the only way I can sleep comfortably. Well, uh, why don't you just try the new bedding brand I just discovered called My Sheets Rock. Their sheets keep you cool so you'll sleep better than ever. They do? They sure do. My Sheets Rock has created the regulator sheets, which are designed to specifically keep hot sleepers cool and cold sleepers comfortable. They regulate temperature, wick moisture, and stay breathable. And they're so soft, you'll sleep comfortable every night. That's because these sheets are made from best-in-class bamboo rayon, the holy grail of sheeting. This miracle material transfers body heat two times more effectively than regular sheets and reduces humidity by 50%, so you can experience your best night's sleep yet. It's true. They sent us a set of sheets to try out, and they were so silky smooth. Plus, they've been a lifesaver in the summer heat. Okay, so so, so why are you in the fridge, too? Oh, I had a dream someone was going to steal my almond milk, so... Got it. Yeah, that tracks. I don't know, Heath. What if I don't believe you? Don't believe me? Their five-star customer reviews speak for themselves. Plus, they offer a 90-day risk-free trial and free shipping and returns. Check out My Sheets Rock at MySheetsRock.com slash scathing. And enter the code SCATHING for 10% off and free shipping. My Sheets Rock, the coolest sheets ever made. Sounds good, Heath. Now, um, can, can you just uh, slide over? I, I want to get to the cold cuts. Okay, oh. but stay away from my almond milk. Okay, obviously. Mine. Yeah, we know it's yours. And now, back to the headlines. In our lead story tonight, damn near one in five Republican senators signed on to a letter urging Trump to cut off federal coronavirus funding to states that don't love Jesus. Fuck your face. Fuck oh. your face. Every one of you. Specifically, they're urging him to, quote, place restrictions on any forthcoming COVID-19 relief funding to states and localities to prevent churches, houses of worship and religious schools and institutions from reopening. End quote. Did I mention fucking face? Yeah, make no mistake here. <laughs> What they're urging Trump to do would literally cause people to die. Withholding relief funding during a pandemic would be killing people as revenge for making churches not kill people. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I got it. Maybe the Republicans are going for some kind of high score situation. Right? Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, they're playing Grand Theft Autocrat. (laughs) (laughs) 
All right, so now if you ask the undersigned, of course, they're going to tell you that they're not calling for special treatment for churches because if their arguments were tethered to reality, they wouldn't be Republicans or Christians. The letter tries to pretend <laughs> that churches have been unfairly targeted, and to justify that, they make repeated references to the fact that cities are fine letting Black Lives Matter protesters gather in way larger numbers than they're allowing for churches. So... These assholes never get to bitch about participation trophies ever, ever again. Their entire <laughs> fucking argument seems to be, well, black people got a thing with crowds, so Republicans should get one, too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to be <laughs> fair, it. their guy got killed by cops 2,000 years ago, and they still aren't <laughs> over it. It's fucking guys. Sir, stop resisting. Sir, stop <laughs> resist. Uh, I'm, I'm nailed to a cross. What the fuck <laughs> <are you doing? laughs> And I, I should note that this letter makes seven references to religious liberty or religious freedom. It is five paragraphs long. <laughs> Clearly, they're trying to sell this fiction that like restricting unnecessary in-person gatherings across the board is a burden specifically and uniquely placed on religion. And as if they wanted to help me summarize the hyperbole at the end of this fucking headline, here's how they close the thing. Quote, we appreciate your commitment that's they're writing this to Trump. So Trump's commitment to protecting American citizens right to exercise their faith, their right to pray for peace and to <laughs> healing a deeply divided nation. End quote. And while we're giving you credit for stuff you actively work against, your commitment to good looking skin and cardio. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and in lockdown news. Last week, again, just in time for it to be too late to be featured on our podcast. That motherfuckers. Show, it's like they have some kind of email chain. They know to stay away from Thursday. Show you gotta favorite. You got to mix it up. Just exactly. randomize yeah. our drops. <laughs> <laughs> Show favorite, Pastor Greg Locke. Oh. Hooked to the internet with his best car rant yet in defiance of having to wear a mask at Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If you're getting so goddamn worked up by your trip to Dunkin' Donuts, you're so fucking excited <laughs> that you're too winded to have a tiny layer of fabric over your face for a few minutes. Apparently, you're Greg Locke. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, yeah uh -huh. And you shouldn't go there anymore, wh whoever you are. You're capable of getting that pissed about anything Dunkin' Donuts related. <laughs> he opens up this ramp by saying that his mask, and this is a quote, separates the body. I'm what? dying to know where he's putting that thing. <laughs> yeah, listen to me. Listener, you must watch this video. Oh, it's so good. It's got him comparing masks to the Holocaust. It's got him comparing masks to abortions at one point yep. for some reason. He, he says masks don't work. And then he describes physically threatening an employee who politely asked him to put one on. But the best, 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 best part is when Pastor Gregory... Hamster farts lock <laughs> announces him. That's his real last name. Real announces name. himself yep. Yep. <laughs> to be the only human on earth with a more irritating coffee <laughs> order yes! than my own. <laughs> According to Locke, twice a day, twice a day, he goes to Dunkin' Donuts and orders two medium coffees with quote seven creams, five sugars Fuck in each you. one. Jesus <laughs> Christ. To which he adds, by the way, again, real quote, yeah, I know, I got a problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, first of all, that is nowhere near as difficult or irritating as Eli's order. It's not even close. So Secondly, that's, that's nowhere line. near Greg Locke's problem. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, here's some details about Dunkin' Donuts. The medium coffee is 14 ounces, and the extra large is 24 ounces. Oh my God. <laughs> so, so either Pastor Locke really fucking needs those four extra ounces or he's an idiot. Okay. Or, or, and I guarantee this is the real answer. He just doesn't have it in himself to say, and I want that with 14 creams and 10 <laughs> sugars. Or 28 creams and 20. He goes twice yeah. a day to avoid that. Right. Yeah. He was doing 14, 10, felt dumb about that. All right. We split him. Uh, so Again. this week we got a little update on Greg's temper tantrum and I gotta believe this is because we have a listener at the Double D Duncan has announced that it will require guests to wear a mask in all its locations nationwide which means Pastor Locke 
It's going to have to take his unending thirst for two medium <laughs> coffee milkshakes elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and in... I'm just a bill on Capitol Hile news. <laughs> oh, well done. The Republican <laughs> yeah. Party of 2020 is getting tired of constantly being called out for opposing the Black Lives Matter movement. And that's why Republican candidates are making it clear that the GOP platform isn't just a one-dimensional thing. For example, besides the opposite of Black Lives Mattering, they <laughs> also stand for... Not being Jewish. Yep. <laughs> and we got two big examples of that message last week in campaign ads for Prosecutor James Linderman of Michigan and also U.S. Senator David Perdue of Georgia. They're both running against a Jewish opponent and their message to voters was uh, basically, guys, y'all know I'm running against a Jewish guy, right? Jewish. <laughs> In government, can you imagine Jewish? I'm honestly, the guy in Georgia, I am 0% surprised, right? Like his, I believe his slogan is, and no, they still haven't apologized for killing Jesus, right? <laughs> it's pretty close. So let's start with James Linderman, the prosecuting attorney for Emmett County, Michigan. In the upcoming primary, he's running against fellow Republican Stuart Fenton, who happens to be Jewish. So Linderman's campaign put out an ad with a graphic of a not dead baby on it that says <laughs> Jim Linderman is truly a Christian vote life, vote family, vote Christian values, which I feel like implies that Jews are fake Christians, right? It does imply yes. <laughs> right. Which is doubly ironic because Christians actually are fake Jews. So. <laughs> <laughs> They're super mad about that. So, the local media got in touch with Mr. Fenton after that ad went out that was super offensive to him. But, and they asked him why he was a liar who's trying to pretend he's a Christian. At, at which point, I'm assuming Fenton was like, oh, yeah, 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 sorry to be deceptive. Um, I'll, I'll wear some identifying pieces of flair from now on. Make it clear for you guys. <laughs> but his campaign manager loudly cleared his throat at that point to block that. And Fenton gave his official response saying, quote, What's the message that Linderman is sending? Keep the Jews out? It's very unchristian like. Is Which it? was further confirmation that Fenton is definitely not a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. I feel like we should test him by bringing a wick into his office and a rock, right? Just, okay, Mr. True Christian, go on. Yeah, you know? right, right, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't think I'd want to tempt him, but yeah, I get your point. Yeah, <sighs> yeah. Good, good idea not to do the tempting. So, that brings us to Georgia GOP Senator David Perdue, whoop, whoop. a member of U.S. Congress since 2015. His Democratic opponent in November is going to be John Ossoff, a Jewish man who uh, I'm assuming often parties with Noah and Lucinda as the only three non-Christian people in that entire state. Mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, you guys, correct me if I'm wrong, you're working on a Nat Geo special like David Attenborough doing the voiceover about, you know, your very curious endangered species adapting to the environment of Georgia. Oh, okay, all right. We we have a we actually have a Hindu now too. Really? All right. So very excited. Congrats on that. Hindu. So the Purdue campaign released an attack ad last week depicting Mr. Ossoff next to New York globalist Chuck Schumer <laughs> with the caption, Democrats are trying to buy Georgia. Also Mr. Ossoff's nose was digitally enlarged in that ad. Ew. Yeah. I guess you could say their attack was a bit too on the nose. Don't say okay. On the nose. okay. And here's the excuse we got from the Purdue campaign about this horribly anti Semitic ad they ran. They said the nose alteration was an error by an outside vendor. They're claiming it was caused by <laughs> resizing and filtering. The original image, well, so, which means uh -huh. the Purdue campaign is working with a graphic designer who has a nose enlarging function in their <laughs> software <laughs> that doesn't enlarge any other parts of a photograph. There's no chance there's not a button on that guy's software with an anti-Semitic slur written on it as the title of the button. Uh, to be fair, we should have been a lot more specific when we asked him to, quote, play up his Jewiness in the photo. So that's on us. <laughs> well, you got to admit, though, this is a step down from the digitally added blood of Christ we put on his hands in the original one. But <laughs> And in the Price is Wrong news, I'll admit it. 
we probably have a little more fun than we should with the Republican atheists here at the Scathing Atheist. Which is any fun at all, really. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are adorable. But nugget. like Disco Idiots. and Herman Cain, it would probably be better to just let them die unnoticed. But damn it, if they don't keep throwing us into our briar patch, and <laughs> I need to tell you about it. So this week's nugget is about one of the members of their board of directors and person who you probably never should have taken seriously, Robert Price. You might remember him oh, for his work. He's on their board of directors. Yeah, of course Republican he is. Yep. You Fucking might remember him for his works on mythicism, including the case against the case for Christ. Yeah, mythicism. Uh, another thing you probably shouldn't have taken seriously, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, this year, Mr. Price took a little jaunt into the world of sci-fi and fantasy, adding a sixth volume to the popular 70s series called Flashing Swords. Well, at least he was going to <laughs> add that sixth volume before the publisher delisted the book from Amazon when the preview revealed he had dedicated his entire editor's introduction to being a fucking crazy person. It was so bad. <laughs> like the audiobook version of this thing was recorded in the parking lot of a Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> <laughs> pulls up next to Greg Locke. Oh, are you doing a cool? Oh, oh, I'll, cool, do, cool, I'll cool. go on the other side. I don't want to bleed into your eyes. You want to double up? I do a little. No, all right. <laughs> now, put a mask on. Sadly, very sadly, <laughs> we are not able to read the full introduction, but a part of it was available through Amazon's sneak peek feature. And that part reads thusly. Oh, good. Sports and games must no longer be based on competition, lest someone feel dejected because of his mediocrity. Okay, I'm with you. Poor little flowers. This, in case you hadn't noticed, is no way to prepare young men or women for adult life in a free market economy and what? in a world full of powerful national enemies. <laughs> for yeah. Sake. Well, I mean, I'd love to defeat Russia by finding the perfect intersection of supply and demand for podcasting, but... Uh, this burgundy ribbon on my wall. <laughs> I, I won this. I love that they make this argument. Like it's particularly effective when we examine it against the backdrop of everyone we know from high school who was really good at football. <laughs> 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 right? Like all the guys who scored four touchdowns in a single game. Whatever happened to them? Uh, they defeated all our national enemies. I'll tell you that. <laughs> They're unemployed from a shoe store. Okay. Yeah. Very next sentence in this sci-fi fantasy collection intro. Yeah, we're not leaving out any connective <laughs> yeah. material there's, there's, here. There's, there's nothing here that's going to make this work for you. Quote, Speaking of powerful <laughs> national enemies, enemies go on. the continued false rape accusations what? serve the same end, seeking to make masculinity, even the natural male interest in women, into a rape culture. Of course, such wolf crying works against women because soon it will become habitual to dismiss every rape accusation as the shrill lying of yet another Lena Dunham. What oh, the fuck? What a terrible world it would be if we didn't take rape allegations seriously. Can you even imagine? <laughs> this section concludes, and again, this is not the whole intro, but this is this is what we could see. This is how it concludes. No wonder we are observing a sudden epidemic of transgendered youth. An epidemic? They are, they are responding to the propaganda which suffuses our society like clouds of mosquito poison pumped out of trucks coming down the street. What? And then, I assume he concluded, anyway, here are some sci-fi and fantasy <laughs> <story>. <laughs> <laughs> and and by the way, it turned out that was as much bullshit as the rest of the intro. <laughs> Speaking of transgender mosquitoes, uh, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> Y'all like flashing swords? So yeah, the authors in the book, in the collection, saw this and of course retracted their permission to use their work, which in turn caused the publisher to delist the book from Amazon, which means... Robbie P has an introduction nobody's using, and Noah, somebody just finished their book. <laughs> oh, so, God. Robert Price, if you're listening, call us, buddy. <laughs> yeah, all call right. Well, us. Quick, while I figure out how to get multiple flashing fonts into a Kindle release, we're going to pause <laughs> for a word from this week's second sponsor, Stamps.com. 
okay, but our bubbles can combine as long as nobody from outside either bubble has visited our bubble. Nobody outside, right, exactly. Okay, but how big can the bubbles be then? Oh, uh, I I honestly don't know. I don't don't really know how it works. What you doing? We're trying to figure out the new normal. Like, who can we see and when? Is it okay to eat outside? It's also confusing. Yeah. Well, at least your business could adjust to the new normal thanks to Stamps.com, huh? What's Stamps.com? Stamps.com brings all the mailing and shipping services you need right to your computer in the comfort of your home or office. Whether you're a small business sending invoices, an online seller shipping out products, or just working from home and need to mail stuff, Stamps.com can handle it all with ease. Thousands of small business owners have discovered the benefits of Stamps.com in recent months. They've been able to keep their business running and avoid the crowds at the post office all from their own computers. Okay, well, that's relief. And with Stamps.com, you get great discounts, too. Five cents off every stamp and up to 62% off USPS and UPS shipping rates. Wait, Noah, Stamps.com does UPS now, too? They sure do. Right now, our listeners get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale without any long-term commitment. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in scathing. That's Stamps.com. Enter scathing. Thanks, Noah. That's one more thing we don't have to worry about. Okay, but what if we want to go out to eat? I have no idea, man. And we're back. Next up in headlines in Alt-Reich news. Nice. Uh, You guys remember the story about the Republican politicians using anti-Semitic propaganda in their campaigning? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, well, those are the moderates. (laughs) The, uh, The GOP also has people like Alabama State Representative Will... Dismukes, a Baptist pastor who proudly announced that he gave the invocation at a birthday party for Nathan Bedford Forrest last week. Jesus. Mr. Forrest just turned 199 years old, and the party was held to honor his dedicated service as a Confederate general uh, who got a silver medal for second place in that Civil War thing. (laughs) He was also the original, very first... Grand Wizard of the KKK. Yep. Okay, this guy is very obviously David Duke making up a pseudonym on the spot, right? <laughs> Got there and he was like, oh, my name, it's William Smooks. <laughs> okay. What a fucking weird impetus for a party. It's like, hey, guys, 199 years ago, our ideas were relevant. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah. Cake! Yeah, so when the news came out that Dismukes was the keynote speaker at a fucking Klan rally, he was pressured to resign from his job. Really? Uh, no, Not as a GOP politician, of course. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah right. Th- this gave him a nice little bump in the polls, I'm sure. I mean his job as a <laughs> pastor. And in response, Dismukes claims that his Baptist church in Alabama was caving in to anti-Southern sentiment and cancel culture. He also added... I wasn't even thinking about that KKK connection. Okay. Uh, fun fact, KKK connection, also the name of our new online dating app. So. <laughs> it's ours? <laughs> yeah. So quick little PSA for Republicans who speak at Klan events. Doesn't really matter what you were musing to yourself during the nope. rally. That's not what we're concerned mm-hmm. with. Like, I was thinking about Jewish people the whole time. Not a good excuse. That makes it worse, in fact, I would mm-hmm. say. Yeah, no, the fact that you hear Nathan Bedford Forrest and don't think of the KKK literally is the problem, man. That That's literally is what we're talking about. <laughs> problem. And also, quick PSA for the voters of Alabama District 88. Hey, you shouldn't be allowed to vote anymore. No, you guys are <laughs> no, done. You lost it. You know how bartenders at TGI Fridays, they get fired if a secret shopper comes in and the bartender doesn't ask for ID when they order a drink? Well, you voted for a Nazi. That's a fail. <laughs> like We need that to be the official rule immediately. And while we're waiting on that, let's just hope the Republican Party can learn to get woke from the politically enlightened folks at Pleasant Hill Baptist Church of Prattville, Alabama, <laughs> who made made this guy resign. The Republican Party did not. Antifa. And finally tonight, former Alabama Chief Justice, self-proclaimed Jewish friend haver, yep. credibly accused child molester, and white Christian Republican guy who lost a Senate race to a Democrat in Alabama. <laughs> 
Roy Moore is currently involved in a lawsuit against Sasha Baron Cohen <laughs> for the crime of Roy Moore being fucking stupid. Oh, and also being a pedophile. Moore is claiming that Cohen is guilty of defamation for suggesting that he's a pedophile. And Cohen is claiming, but you are. <laughs> so, what? Yeah, sorry for showing that video of you saying the things you said. You lose, <laughs> but I'm sorry. I don't know what I yeah. do legally. No, to, to which Roy Moore said, but your honor, I don't think he even means it when he says that. It didn't sound very <laughs> sincere. So this thing all started two years ago when Roy Moore did an interview on Cohen's satirical show, Who is America? Without realizing the show is satire and entirely engineered to make the guest look like an idiot. Moore didn't even realize this once he got on the set with Sasha Baron Cohen, who's pretending to be a former Israeli commando and wearing a ridiculous prosthetic face with uh, approximately 20 of... My eyebrows glued across his forehead. <laughs> yes, it's true. Eventually, Cohen pulls out a fake device that he claims they invented in the Israeli military to protect children from pedophiles. He, he explains how it's a sensor that detects pedophile pheromones. And, and he says, so the phrase sweating like a rapist is actually based on science. At which point, Roy Moore says, mm hmm, and leans way back in his chair, trying to kind of slide away. <laughs> Cohen continues, and describes how the device starts beeping when it's near a child molester. So <laughs> to show it, show how it works, he waves the wand next to himself and nothing happens. And then he waves it near Roy Moore and it starts making noise. This goes on for minutes before Roy Moore finally decides so to leave and realizes he's in a prank. And then he went home, called his lawyer and filed a defamation suit for $95 million. Okay. Wow. Technically, he should be suing the wand for defamation. Take it serious, right. boy. <laughs> Gotta do the wand. I love that amount. Like, I could have bought his reputation with a gift card that might still have a few bucks on it from anywhere. But now, all of a sudden, it's valued at $95 million? No, sir. I feel like you overshot that a little bit. So, the latest hearing in that case happened last week. Initially, Cohen's lawyer, Liz McNamara, tried to have the case thrown out because very obvious satire is legally protected. But that didn't work for whatever reason. So now she's arguing that Cohen can't be guilty of defamation for stating a fact. <laughs> and she basically just stared at Roy Moore in the courtroom and said, okay, so if we're going to proceed, we'll need to do a full discovery process to determine, you know, here in court, Roy Moore, look at me, officially determine... <laughs> If the plaintiff is, in fact, you, Roy Moore, I'm talking to you, going to determine if you're, in fact, a pedophile. At which point, I assume a Roy Moore-shaped puff of smoke was all that was left in the courtroom? <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently Roy Moore is way too stupid to understand what's happening because he still has not dropped the suit. I guess he's banking on the U.S. court system not having access to the Israeli wand technology. Fingers crossed for Roy Moore. <laughs> I think he was making up that pheromone stuff. All right. Well, it's always good to end on a cliffhanger, so we're going to close the headlines there. Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Shrill Lena Dunham. And when we come back, Seth Andrews will be here to give me voice envy again. I'm excited to welcome tonight's guest back to the show. Seth Andrews is the host of the Thinking Atheist podcast and the author of Deconverted, A Journey from Religion to Reason. But I've asked him on today to talk about his brand new book, Confessions of a Former Fox News Christian. So first things first, welcome back, Seth. Good to be here. It's funny. I always have to. I didn't realize when I titled the book, I have to make a distinction. Like, did you work for Fox News? And I'm like, no, 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 no. I, I say I'm a Fox News Christian in the way that I say that, or I was a Fox News Christian in the way that I say I used to be like a Reagan evangelical. Mm -hmm. You know, I was a viewer. I was part of the culture, but it, I didn't realize that was going to be the case. And until the book came out and people asked me, but no, 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 I, I'm a Fox News Christian, meaning that I was sort of on the receiving end of that culture. Oh, so. that's interesting. It did not occur to me to think that, but yeah, no, I guess I could, I can see people looking for the clarification there. I'm curious if I'm going to hear from the network at all. I can't imagine. I mean, they're going to think I'm a small fish and nobody cares, but 
You never know. Hey, man, a good lawsuit by Fox News could really push some paper for you. <laughs> That's all I need. Yeah, great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they'll bleed me to death, but I might sell a few extra books. Yeah, that there you fantastic. go. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So. All right. Now, before we get into the book itself, I, because like me, you're stuck in one of the dumb states when it comes to the pandemic and all all the other stuff, too. Um, So I'm, I'm curious, how, how's quarantine treating you there in Oklahoma? Are you guys? Oh, it's uh, terrifying. It's yeah. terrifying, Noah. I mean, this is strawberry red state, Oklahoma, and people are either tired, like they're worn out, and I get fatigue. Right. I understand. You know, we're social animals, and it's so frustrating to be isolated from other people, and we miss our routines. We miss our loved ones. So, I mean, that part I can kind of get, right? So they roll the dice and say, ah, fuck it. I'm going to go and just be with my people, and whatever happens, happens. But there is another part of the state that is convinced that this is all part of some vast Illuminati type conspiracy yep. to rig the November election and even worse to somehow spread a one world government, uh, and to I, microchip I people with vaccines. It's yeah. look, my own mother, and I'm not throwing her under the bus. Because quite frankly, I think she's got it coming. <laughs> she, she shares this conspiracy theory on Facebook. And I only know about it, not because she follows me, because my own mother unfriended me years ago. Because she can't stand it, you know, all the heathenry that I post. Mm -hmm. But my wife is still friends with her on Facebook. And she shared this conspiracy theory that Bill Gates once roomed with Fauci back at, at Cornell and that Fauci used to be the CEO of a pharmaceutical company that once made the gases that killed the Jews during the Holocaust. What? And George Soros was behind that. And then, uh, and, and the primary stockholder in the pharmaceutical company was Jeffrey Epstein, who was <laughs> killed in prison. I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. And my mother shared this online. And I'm like, just a, a slight, just 10 seconds of searching online reveals everything that's wrong. First of all, Bill Gates would have had to have been like eight years old. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. If, if Which roomed. is how old Fauci would have had to been when he was making those gases, I guess. Right. Right. <laughs> and, you know, and this the Soros, he was from Hungary, not Germany. And mm -hmm. he came from a Jewish family. He escaped the Holocaust. I mean, uh, uh, Jeffrey Epstein was never the primary stockholder in this pharmaceutical company. I mean, if you look at, at any of the details of the story, and in fact, it turns out that it was sort of satirical. Somebody made up a conspiracy using names in the headlines just to sort of satirize conspiracy theories. And what do the conspiracy whack jobs do? They grab it and go, see, I told you. Yeah. And so this is going on in, in Oklahoma. I see a lot of it around here. And it makes me fear for the species. I mean, I'm terrified. I'm rooting for the killer asteroid. You know, we don't deserve to survive the apocalypse. Well, and it, what's, what's so terrifying about it is something like this forces people like you and me, people who live amongst them, to come face to face with the fact that this is not the fringe. No. Right? This is not just some tiny little... The, this is... It's at least enough of a majority to, like, get the schools to open back up and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. And I write about this in the book. We talk, and again, I have to put the caveat that these are trends. There are always exceptions to the rule because if I talk about statistics and trends and those types of things, there are going to be those who don't fit into the cookie cutter or can think of examples that refute that and they're going to throw those out and mm -hmm. your email inbox is going to be filled. But there is a lot of data behind the reality that people who lean into this sort of MAGA conservatism are more prone in terms of their brains to messages that speak to fear, right? The yep. amygdala fires up and and they double down and they want to erect the wall and they become extremely tribalistic and xenophobic. And they are also a lot more prone to believe and embrace conspiracies. There's actually like uh, the brains of these types of conservatives may be different than the brains of people who are not. And I don't even know what to do with that, right? I mean, how yeah. do you circumvent that? 
Education doesn't seem to be working. I mean, if I go and I refute the George Soros, Jeffrey Epstein, Bill Gates conspiracy theory and say, no, it's not 5G and microchips and everything else, that's not. If I give them the data, it doesn't make any difference. It bounces right off of them. No, you're you're part of the conspiracy or you're a sheeple. You're, you've been snowed by it. It's one of the other. There's yeah. a um, Rush Limbaugh is a huge right-wing radio behemoth that the MAGA conservatives just love. And he actually wrote decades ago about what he called the four corners of deceit. And he included science Mm -hmm. and scientists in his list. I mean, they're one of the top four. I mean, talk about being primed to distrust the evidence. This is a culture that thinks, well, if the scientists are saying it, they're all part of this star chamber conspiracy to kill God anyway. Why would we take anything they have to say to the bank? No wonder Fauci is swimming upstream trying to get a few things done in this country. People are just resistant to the data, you know? Yeah. All right, so so you've you've definitely steered this conversation back towards the book a couple of times. So let me let me help you push some paper here. I said we already discussed the fact that Fox News Christian does not mean person who used to work for Fox News. But I, I'm curious to know, like, what does that mean to you? What is a Fox News Christian as opposed to just a Christian? Well, and I want to make another distinction. There are, I mean, it's not all that common, but I do have people who are atheists non-religious people who are political conservatives, meaning that they are, they call themselves fiscal conservatives or whatever. And that's a whole other conversation. So I'm, I'm not necessarily talking about the person who is acting the way they act. They're voting the way they vote because they are convinced that, you know, they, that voting against the Republican party means they're going to be taxed to death. And maybe they've got concerns about borders, blah, blah, blah. And and so I'm not talking about that ilk necessarily. I'm talking about a culture of people that get their information about the world from one or two primary sources. It's interesting when we look at the 2016 election of Donald Trump, the uh, research shows that while Non-conservatives actually got their news from a variety of different sources, whether it was NPR, whether it was CNN, or whether it's you know, online or even local news. The research found that the people who voted for Donald Trump, 40% of them got their news about the world exclusively from Fox, wow. from a single network. In fact, the mayor of New York actually credited the network Fox News for tipping the election in Donald Trump's favor in 2016. I mean, it's a staggering claim. This network is number one. It's just massively dominant in its time slot. It is a monster moneymaker. And of course, that sort of popularity becomes what they think is a credibility builder. Well, of course, I mean, if it's that popular, they must be doing something right, which is terrifying, right? (laughs) Because that's a majority rule approach to to what is factual and what is not. And I mean, I hope we don't determine truth by what's popular. That's terrifying, right? But it's, uh, you know, it, it's a tunnel vision type of culture. And, and Fox News is brilliant at saying we are, quote, fair and balanced. That's a trademark slogan. What's the implication? Everybody else, they're unfair. They're unbalanced. Don't trust them. You can trust us. And then they shape this narrative. And if you look at the origins, forgive the long answer. If you look at the origins of Fox News, the power players, Roger Ailes, the president for 20 years of Fox News, he was back part of the Nixon administration repackaging freaking Nixon and Republican talking points so they would catch on in the culture. Roger Ailes actually tried unsuccessfully to start a conservative news network a few years before he was appointed to Fox. It failed, but you can see his focus, right? He's packaging conservative talking points as news, and there's a huge culture of Americans waiting to gobble it up. Yeah, there was, you know, pre-Fox News, there existed this trope that, the media had a liberal bias. I remember seeing books about that when I was a kid and, and it was nonsensical by and large. There were probably a few issues, especially environmentalism, where there was definitely a pronounced liberal bias. Um, but, you know, liberal bias is very often biased towards reality, right? When it comes to issues like climate change. So that trope existed and Fox News, boy, I'll tell you, they really did a number on it on monetizing that. 
So uh, I, I would say the most disturbing thing that I learned in reading your book is that Fox News is only one year older than my marriage, <laughs> which was <laughs> terrifying. It made me feel real old. But so that means it was around when you were still a conservative Christian. Were you a were you one of those people that got their news exclusively from the single source? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was really a sort of a, a David and Goliath holy war against the evil other, which is stupid because I right? mean, Fox the News has never one. been David. <laughs> Right. I mean, to say that they're against the mainstream media while being a ratings giant is just a contradiction any way you slice it. But, I, you know, it, it fed a lot of my own perceptions about the world. I'd been raised in an evangelical home. The world is under attack by Satan. We're approaching the end times. The United States belongs to my specific God. Our founders were all Christian. You know, even the right to own guns was somehow linked to my God. I'm not sure exactly why Almighty God needs me to have firepower. Right. Yeah, you know, I'm not really sure what munitions have to do with, uh, you know, God, divine protection, but okay, fine. And so all of my perceptions had been sort of created in this cocoon of fundamentalist Christianity. And so when I see Sean Hannity and Bill O'Reilly and and all those people on Fox News who were talking about the fact that the United States is under attack, the seculars are coming, the liberals are coming, the godless are coming, and they want to take away what we hold most dear. Well, as I enjoyed unbelievable freedom and latitude, to do and worship and pray and carry out any religious tradition and celebrate religious holidays. And, and well, as long as I had all of this freedom, but at the same time, I had convinced myself and Fox News and that culture of right wing media had convinced me that, man, I'm persecuted. Mm -hmm. And if you read the Bible, Jesus commands the believer, you need to be persecuted for my sake. So here I am with all this freedom and latitude. And if I don't actually experience persecution, well, how am I supposed to be a good believer, right? If Satan doesn't care about me, then I'm ineffective for God. What am I going to do? Well, I just make it up. I just manufacture the persecution. Now I'm a great Christian, a crusader in God's army. And this explains a lot of the total horseshit about the war on Christmas every year, right? You and I have to endure the war on Christmas. Mm -hmm. And then Donald Trump comes out and he's like, you can now say Merry Christmas again, as if he had reached into the throats of 300 <laughs> plus million Americans. He had liberated them at the vocal cords. So now they can actually speak the words without being oppressed. And the MAGA conservatives and the Fox News Christians just eat this nonsense up. It's maddening. Oh, yeah. No, it, it, maybe the best line in your book. And I hate to spoil it for people who haven't read it yet. But uh, yeah, Trump sets himself as literally the savior of the savior in that moment. So speaking of he who should not be named, I, I'm dying to know, <laughs> do you think that the Seth Andrews of, you know, whatever, 20 years ago would have voted for Donald Trump? You know, I, I, I don't think so. Look, I, you know, I was, it's like this. I had already started cherry picking my faith back in the 90s. I had, my best friend came out as gay which was just abhorrent to me because mm -hmm. I had been trained that, you know, we called them the homos and the lesbos and you know, we dehumanized them, right? We thought, well, they're just perverse people who've, who've broken God's master plan for human sexuality and they're the other. I totally othered them. So then my best friend writes me a letter and tells me that he's, he's gay, and I totally just tilt. I just went into overdrive. I had no idea how to process it. We didn't speak for a year. But I had to sort of come to a point where I thought, well, I'm this man was, he is an important part of my life. And I am now willing to discard the anti-gay verses of the Bible to accept him. And so I started to sort of fashion my own faith based on my own moral compass. That was in the 90s. And now I started to become slowly less bigoted, less judgmental about a lot of different people. And, and even though I probably would have wanted to protect the Republican party because I still felt it was the party of God, I can't imagine I would have watched the jaw dropping 
circus of Donald Trump and not just thought, oh, you know, screw this. I mm. can't imagine. I mean, to me, it just seems obvious. I look at the Republican Party now and what Hemet Mehta at Friendly Atheist has called the moral rot of the evangelical right. And I'm, I just think, no, I don't even think of when I was a believer. I, I, I don't think I would have stayed on for this ride. I, I just don't see how anyone can look at Donald Trump with any objectivity and get behind him. His own autobiographer, his own biographer, Tony Schwartz, wrote The Art of the Deal back in the 80s. Mm-hmm. Tony Schwartz, during the election of 2016, comes forward and says, warning, hang on, everybody. I made all this shit up. This is all fiction. We, I thought it was harmless at the time. We were selling books. I had no idea the guy was going to run for president. Right. <laughs> you know? And nobody cared. His niece's book is out, which I think is an actually a pretty good examination of Donald Trump and his formative years and sort of, you know, his father and brother and how he came to be who he is, et cetera. And the fact that Donald Trump essentially is a trust fund baby who's been bailed out his whole freaking life and got bailed out again by becoming a reality TV star. He was never a great businessman or real estate investor. He's filed bankruptcy how many times, defrauded college students, et cetera. I mean, his whole life is a fiction. Nobody cares, you know? And and I I just don't think I would have, I, I think I would have cared. I'd like to think I would have cared. You know, maybe I'm deluded and kidding myself, but... Um, well, the thing is that we... We do know that eventually you got out anyway, right? So, yeah, it's a very good chance this just would have accelerated it. Maybe. It may be. It it certainly, I think, would have distanced me from these people who are telling, essentially, the Franklin Grahams and the Paula Whites and the Robert Jeffresses and all these mega pastor evangelical types who are waltzing in and out of the White House at will and enjoying monumental Christian privilege, telling the rest of us how to live. I'm I'm sure I'm in my bones. I'm sure I would have thought to myself, these hypocrites have no business telling anybody else how to live. Yeah, I desperately it's it's happening in small microcosms. There are uh, Republican groups like the Lincoln Projects and Republicans against Donald Trump, an organized group producing media, scathing, amazing media online that's speaking out against him because they are operating from a moral center. They're like, this is morally wrong. This is not us. This I have a saying that I like to use. I'm like, if Donald Trump is us, then shame on us. Yeah. And none of this, well, you know, the Lord sometimes uses terrible people to do his will. That's just total horseshit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but that sure is the go-to for these people, right? The, the whole, well, yeah. you know, David was, you know, Bathsheba, you know, he wasn't a great guy, but God, <laughs> yeah, they, they they love to go there. I was telling somebody, you know, look, if your spouse exhibited these characteristics, predatory behavior, pathological lying, unbelievable rampant insecurity and outward ego, you know, crushing people under boot, bilking your vendors, you know, groping your own daughter for pizza. I mean, whatever. If your husband did this shit, what would your reaction? Be? Oh, oh, I wouldn't live with that. What if your son did it? Oh, God, it'd be terrible. What if your neighbor did it? I wouldn't want to have anything to do with him. What if the president of the quote unquote free world does it? Well, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes God uses flawed people. It's a total double standard and it makes me crazy. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure we're going to take a lot of shit for time. Do you talk a lot of politics on the skating? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Every time no. I get into it, I'm always inundated with people who are like, well, you know, you're spot on when it comes to religious criticisms. But I sure wish you hadn't taken up the religion of liberalism or that you're a orange man, bad Trump hater, which is a way of of essentially ignoring the long litany of evidence that should cause us all to walk away from the man. You know, it's it's a little disheartening. I mean, we see it sometimes in the atheist quote unquote movement. Yeah. Well, I, I will say we pretty effectively ran off all of our uh, all of our Trump supporting listeners in November uh, of 2016, <laughs> if not before. I was I was shocked to find out we still had a few. All right. So I have one final question for you. I'm going to try to end on something a little uplifting, at least here. In your opinion, as a former Fox News Christian, is there an antidote to Fox News? 
Well, I don't think you're going to beat that network with another network. I think what we have to do, and I'm not Yoda on this subject, okay? But I think we have to change the culture beyond the broadcasts. I am I'm in this weird place, Noah, where I'm a guy who is reasoned out of unreasonable ideas. All right, so I'm an example that somebody can go through and come out the other side and hopefully be a better person. I mean, I feel like I'm a more reasonable, more centered, more humanistic person. I'm kinder. I'm less judgmental. I'm more open to the evidence. I'm more tuned in with the world around me. I feel like my life's better. So I'm living proof that it's possible. But I'm also struck by the fact that I'm surrounded by brick walls and I'm tired of getting no ground as I try to have these conversations. But I still think the conversations are important and we should continue to attempt to have them. I don't think we walk into the room with uh, people who are Fox News Christians and say, uh, this is tempting, but it is to walk in and say, is the Kool-Aid delicious? Right? That's real <laughs> tempting. <laughs> but I think we, we start with a lot of Socratic method. We ask a lot of questions and we present a different point of view. There's a, a story that was told in a documentary called The Brainwashing of My Dad about a guy who was locked into Rush Limbaugh. And he was just a, he just had totally become that guy. And when he was introduced to other ideas, in a kind way, he was introduced to other ideas. He slowly began to acclimate to a world larger than the pod that he existed in. And so I think, you know, we're going to have to defeat bad speech with better speech. I think we solve the cultural problem as best we can with relationships and conversation I think if we just scream at each other, everybody's doubling down, the amygdala's fire, the, you know, the backfire effect kicks in. And so I, I think if, if we do our best to try to, to speak, not shout, to have conversations, to try to humanize the other that they have been taught to fear. I'm a secular, liberal, humanist, Democrat, insert adjective here or noun here. But if they get to know me as a human being and, they like what they see and they come to trust me, then they can't put me in a box. And that's the moment when real conversations can begin. It's an imperfect answer, but it's, it's all I got, Noah. It's all I got. So. Hey, uh, hope springs eternal, man. Like yeah. the, the fact that there are people like you out in the world that really did buy all the way in and don't anymore is basically all I can cling to at this point. All right, well, I'll tell you what, the new book is out now. By the time this interview comes out, it should also be available on Audible, read by the silky, smooth-voiced author. Be sure to check the show notes for links to pick up your copy. Seth, thanks again for hanging out, man. Dude, it's a pleasure, and thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Before we put our masks back on tonight, I want to thank Tim Robertson for all the work he does for the company. I always say at the end of the show that he does our social media, but he does so much more than that. He's really become an integral part of the puzzle in the Thunderstorm family, and it's hard to remember how the fuck we managed to do all this shit without him. Tim, thank you, sir. Anyway, that's all the blast movie we've got for you tonight, but we'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show, The Skeptocrat, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern Time on Monday, and even new episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday, and an even newer episode of our half sister show, Citation Needed, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I'd be the villain in this story if I neglected to thank Heath Enright for helping keep me sane, Lucent Delusions for being the sane one when Heath fails, and Eli Bosnick for reminding me that sanity is overrated. And once again, Lucinda apologizes for her absence. She should be back next week. I also need to thank a New Zealander for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. That's been in my inbox since before the pandemic. So let me just say to all of New Zealand, on behalf of all of America's atheists, we forgive you. Now, please put in a good word with Jacinda for us, if you have a chance. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's best people, Travel and Texan, Margaret, Phil, Amy, Stephen, is a Sandwich, Jeff, Cameron, and Carl. Travel in Texas, Margaret and Phil, whose fists are so fast they make quantum entanglement jealous. Amy, Stephen, and is a Sandwich, whose IQs are higher than I have to be to make it through GAM movies. And Jeff, Cameron, and Carl, who are so virile they have to wear condoms just to send dick pics. Together, these nine naughty non-believers nudged our net worth northward this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the money it takes to give us money, but if you do, you can make a per-episode donation to patreon.com slash 
donating ADS, whereby you'll early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode. Or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scanningads.com. And if you'd like to help, but not if it costs you money, you can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review, telling a friend about the show, or following at PAATPod on Twitter. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robertson handles our social media. Our audio engineer is Morgan Clark. Wilson wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingadius.com. You want to split that almond milk? No. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved.